Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Hi, Janet. It's great to have you here today. Uh, Thank you very much for asking me. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I think we're going to have a good chat. We've got lots of things to talk about. Um, Do you want to introduce yourself to start with, Janet, and tell us a bit Uh, about you? Yeah, I'm Janet Richardson. I've worked in supported housing for 35 years. Um, I've worked for the three largest, you know, three of the largest housing associations, places for people, um, Anchor Housing and Riverside. And I've also worked for lots of little organisations. So I have a vast array of experience working with young people, people with dementia, older people. And I always specialised in learning disabilities and physical disabilities that was my specialism and just recently I've gone back to my roots where I started from and I'm now working with young people again fantastic so kind of full circle full circle yeah yeah and when we um when we first spoke the thing that really interested me Janet was about your background and what you were doing obviously you've been in this sector for a long time and you've seen probably so many different changes and things come and go but um Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff you were doing earlier on that we were chatting about? Yeah. Um, When I first moved into housing, initially it was to work with young people who the government put some money forward and it was to bring young people back who'd run away to live in London. And although that was a three year project, to be honest, it wasn't that successful because really the young people didn't want to come back because when we brought them back, they still didn't have anything. So that was the reason they'd run away in the first place. And then we um, did a lot of work with general needs tenants who needed support because not everybody who lives in a general needs tenancy knows how to cope with bills and finances and that kind of thing. And then the hospital closure program was announced by the government. And that was the government recognized that people who were in psychiatric, long stay psychiatric hospitals who had been there, some of them 50, 60 years, really shouldn't be there because if you or I were ill we would go you know if you had an appendicitis you would go into hospital you'd have your appendix removed you'd have a little bit of recovery time and you'd be sent home and people with a learning disability in particular had been put into these hospitals and basically left and um, it was a tender you had to apply for the tender and we won I think four out of five of the ones in the north of England And what we had to do was we had to find out a lot about the people who we were going to rehouse. And we rehoused over 100 people, some of them in their late 70s who had been incarcerated since they were at the age of five. Um, We had to go around all of the long stay hospitals, which was literally horrific. And I think um, the nursing staff were doing the best they could and really did care about the people and things had changed um, but not enough really and so you would go into a ward where they would have 16 beds in a ward and people would be sitting in a corner of the of the room banging their heads against a wall and rocking because there wasn't a lot of stimulation and that wasn't a reflection on the nurses it was just that's how it had been for so long and they were trying really hard to change that so we or I should say, work in a very person-centred way. So when somebody was, uh, we had the list, so we would look at the person, find out what their likes, dislikes were, where their family lived. Some of them were miles away from family because that was the closest point that could put them into. Um, and one, there's a, a few that really resonated with me. One of them was a man who was in his late 70s who had been born without any ears. So he had been presumed that he was deaf and, you know, um, had a quite a a big learning disability. So when he was five, he was put into the children's unit because all of these hospitals had children's units. So he'd grown up there without, you know, his family around him. They were allowed to visit once a month. And that resonated with me because my older son is profoundly deaf. And I looked at, you know, that man who had been locked away for, you know, 60 odd years. And that, when you think about it like that, that's 60 years, that's in our lifetime. It's not years ago, you know, it's within our lifetime. My son is 30, went to an ordinary school, got his A-levels, his O-levels, got a degree, and he now works and lives with his partner and is really happy. If I had been born 60 or 70 years ago, he could have quite literally ended up in a place like that. And and I think because of that, that really 
as I say, resonated with me as a person. And I just thought then that we can't allow that to happen ever again. Um, I wish I could say that was the case, but actually it's not the case. And I think that's why, you know, people like yourself setting up the gateway is such a great idea to link people because although the government have put money into supported housing over the last 20 or 30 years, it's nowhere near enough. And it's nowhere near what they put in for general needs housing and social housing. Mm -hmm. And the big organisations do predominantly do the, the, no, the what I would call the normal social housing, the yeah. three yeah. two bed houses. And that they do a lot of work around supported housing, but there's a big gap. Absolutely. And I think the thing that really, from when you're speaking about it, you use the term incarcerated these people you felt had been incarcerated in these hospitals yeah. they were called hospitals weren't they, they? called hospitals yeah but actually they didn't have any human rights they didn't have any liberty they, were, no, they, they didn't. didn't have the freedom and I think I think as you say this is in our lifetime we talk I, you know I've spoken to I Jill Fielding on as a guest she was talking about her brother had a very similar experience to this he he was had learning disabilities he was placed in care at a very young age you know and she fought uh, sort of only about 10 20 years ago to get him out of institutional care and into a sort of more of a, a supported living setting and and yeah, the yeah. changes that she's seen in him since then and you know I think it's very easy for us to assume as you're saying this is you know this is hundreds of years ago and it's so isn't it's is it, it you know? it's so isn't no and I think um you know I could I could wax lyrical about all of the people I've met over the years and you know the, there's some that really stand out for me and when I say incarcerated I, I really mean that because you would go and one of the big things, there was a few things that really stuck out in my mind. One was they virtually all had horrible decayed teeth. None of them had a nice set of teeth because they didn't take them to a dentist because they wouldn't sit in the chair and be quiet. And so they just didn't take them. And um, they would have, you'd have a tall man who would be six foot four with a pair of trousers half mast. You'd have a tiny little man with braces on to keep his trousers up because every morning, they had to stand in a line and there was somebody behind a hatch who would hand out a bunch of clothes. They weren't their clothes. <laughs> they could be anybody's clothes. So even down to the basic needs like that of having your own clothes, they didn't have, you know, and one of the men who we housed, when he came out, he loved um, checky shirts. And if you went to see him, he had no verbal communication at all. And you know, he could be quite disruptive, but the change in his behaviour was absolutely unbelievable. So when you would go and visit him, once he was in a beautiful house and was happy and had lovely carers, his one pleasure was taking you to see his wardrobe where it was full of checky shirts and he used to pick a different shirt every day. Now, some people will think that a simple little thing like that, but that gave that man so much pleasure and not only pleasure it gave him some rights because he chose which shirt he wanted to wear and if he didn't want to wear the blue shirt he would wear the green shirt where before he wasn't ever given that choice he didn't even have choice about what he wore mm -hmm. and it I think people when I talk about it are still saying you know is this real can this really have happened but I can assure you it really did happen mm -hmm. and and it, I think it really stresses the importance, doesn't it, of personalised care and of people yeah. having, you know, packages of care and support that are adapted for their needs with people who Definitely. know them, you know. Yeah, yeah. And they the do flourish and grow. And, um, you know, the one thing that I can remember is we once had, because what would happen is the, there would be social workers and nursing staff. There was a big, a massive, big group of people who did the closure program and my job was all was um to find the housing and you know go through all of that kind of thing planning etc and make sure the house was fit for purpose you know we had things like a house that was like a marshmallow inside because the person had severe epilepsy so nothing could be protruding so the floor was soft the walls were soft so it was down to that kind of really detail um but it it's just amazing when you see the change in people um and how much the growth so we had people who that we were told couldn't speak and you would go to their door six months after they'd moved in and they would open the door themselves after you'd knocked on the door and say hello come in this is my house and you would think well I thought you couldn't speak and the reason they couldn't speak was because if if you were locked in a place that was horrible and you, you weren't 
you didn't have your own personality basically then you just revert back into yourself mm. and I mean the nursing staff had tried really hard there was the before we got involved before social housing got involved there was a program where the people who were on the very mild end of learning disability spectrum or mild autistic some of them were sort of not officially adopted by nursing staff, but they would go and live with nursing staff who had a spare bedroom. And it was a bit like care in the community and done in very small batches. And that really was the catalyst that then started the big programme to close the long stay hospital. Really? I didn't know that's what was the sort of yeah. trigger for it. Or yeah. what the changes in people's behaviour when they were- the, Well, it was the changes in people's behaviour. And I think a lot of people, um, I mean, there were families who said they wanted their young person or their older person to stay where they were because they felt they were safe. And obviously, so well, I'd like to say they were all safe, but we've all heard some horror stories mm. over the years about different hospitals and things. So, but I think they felt that they were safe from the general public who might make fun of them or, you know, abuse them and that kind of thing. And it took a lot of persuading to make parents and carers realize that this was going to be a change that they would have 24 hour staff they would be safe they would have a lovely home to live in and they would have choice they would have and i think choice was a big thing mm -hmm. some of the parents who were adamant at the beginning that they didn't want this then became our greatest advocates because they could see the difference in the life of, of the young person and i think what we're seeing now is that you know, people with a learning disability and challenges haven't stopped being born. There's, you know, there's still hundreds and hundreds of them out there. But what we see now is parents want the best for their children. They want them to have the same life choices as our children have, mm -hmm. and rightly so. So when, so that's why there's, there's still this great need to have specialist supported housing because they do need some support and some care and all of the things that you know the wraparound care so that they can live independently. But they can live independent just the same as the rest of us they just need that little bit of extra support and i think there's still i still get phone calls regularly from people telling me they need a property for i had one the other day for a young man who's been in in hospital for six months years he's mm -hmm. a young man he's in 200 miles away from home you know he doesn't need to be there he can't see his family so we talk about this as though it's in the past tense and that you know i'm hopeful that this young man has got more stimulus than that is better supported in the hospital environment he's in but it's still it's still not meeting his needs where he's he is currently and and that's not a lone story is it i'm sure you're no, it's you, know, not. No. you know this is all over the country and and it's a lack of property principally yes. i think that's driving that isn't it is that would you it agree is. with that i would agree with that and i think you know the big organizations are doing their best but um you know if they get it something off the government that says we want you to build you know 20,000 houses this year the cost of those 20,000 houses compared with the cost of really good supported housing the specialist unit you know they're a lot more expensive so if they can get you know 100 houses for general needs where you would get one supported house they're going to do that um, and they do try their best and they do provide really good housing but as I say there's a big gap Mm -hmm. it really is it's you know and do you see have a kind of clear vision of where you think it will go or what you think the future is going to be like for specialist supported housing I think um my one worry is that um in housing yeah, we're very heavily regulated and the housing regulator rightly so checks everything and you've got to have good governance you've got to have you know all of the things that you need all of your data in place um, you've got to do fair rents and all of that kind of thing and I think the one worry is that this this need to generate more houses what the worry is that they're not regulated and I think what the regulator and I've spoken to some people who work for the regulator they are watching this and that they know that you know there's this big movement of people who are private landlords and investors wanting to help um, and I think what, what we'll see is there'll be some regulation put in place to make sure that the, the providers are protected and the people who were put in the houses are protected as well and I think so uh, if, if anybody asked me I would say as long as you um, are doing it properly and with the right um, sort of feelings about why you're doing it you know it, it's not just to make a lot of money you're doing it for the right reasons mm -hmm. and I would say try and join up with 
a registered provider. There's lots of very small, really good housing associations who can't do massive development. So they, you know, might work with you and lease properties off you. Um, and that way they would be regulated. And as a, a movement, because I think it is a big movement, you, you see more and more of it on LinkedIn and on Facebook about what people are doing. It might be that there is a time and place where, you know, you need to go to the regulator and say, look, we are willing to do whatever it is to make sure that we're regulated, because I think the regulator would probably think that was a really good way of protecting yourselves and protecting what you're wanting to do. So you're talking about developers becoming regulated yeah. in that space. Well, I think, yes, developers and private landlords, because I think, you know, the um, the worst thing that could happen would be that a private landlord would just put somebody in and then six months down the line, change their mind and say, well, actually, I want the house back because mm -hmm. that's not giving people the security of tenure and the, the security of having their safe home. So yeah. it's about the protection of that. And I think as long as the um, private investors go through either a gateway or fully understand themselves what they're getting into mm -hmm. and what um, care providers, the people who, the, who are going to move in, their families and carers, what they actually are expecting. Mm -hmm. And as long as that all marries up, then I think it should be, you know, a good thing to do. Yeah. I think it's it's really interesting. I think there's going to be a lot of changes in the space. And part of me thinks that bringing in too much regulation will make it harder for that, pro you know, that property supply and scare off private investors. But you're right. We do need the right investors in the space and the right developers who are there and, and yeah. doing it for the right reason. Because as you say, if someone takes on a property and it's their home for life and it's been adapted for their needs, you can't yeah, yeah. just grab it back you, you no, know you can't. it's not it's fair a, it's not sort of it's not the kind of thing that you would do and think well in five years I could sell my portfolio and I'd be you know that's not what it's about it's going to be about the long term and you know giving people that security mm -hmm. and I suppose if the private landlords or the developers are a bit worried about the um the regulation then they could work with as I said, a small organisation who already are working with the regulator. So they would take over that onus and that responsibility of doing that for you. Janet, thank you. It's been really interesting talking to you. Thanks ever so much. We'll yeah. drop your contact details in the show notes below so people can find you. Thanks Lovely. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.